Hi, it's Dark Centeno, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Today, we're going to focus on uh, the upper neck facet joints and how they're involved and in probably causing a lot of headache pain in CCI patients. So as usual, I'll go through sort of a short lecture on that topic, and then we're going to switch into uh, Q&A. Q&A uh, can really be about any topic, certainly can be about that topic but it could be about anything you'd like to ask. So I wanna make sure that's, that's clear. So let me share my screen here. And I'm going to go into this uh, lecture and get that started. Okay, so how do the upper neck facet joints cause headaches in CCI patients. So a lot of CCI patients I meet uh, believe that their headaches are due to fairly esoteric causes. And what I mean esoteric is that if you had to line up all the reasons why someone with neck pain would have headaches, these would be some of the more rare causes. Uh, Internal jugular vein compression is a rare cause of headaches, even in CCI patients, and certainly in patients with neck pain. Intracranial hypertension, also a rare cause. Chiari malformation, also a rare cause. In addition, all three of these have in common a big, big, massive problem. The only way to see if they're causing your headache is to do surgery and then if the headache goes away, we know what that was the problem. But there is no test I can run um, that will allow me to prove that these are causing your headache. You may have these things, but whether or not they're causing your headache can't be easily proven other than doing things like decompressing uh, the internal jugular vein or taking out a piece of the back of the skull in the case of Chiari malformation. So, and, and these are again, esoteric causes. Now, these are much more common causes of headaches in people with neck pain, including CCI. Occipital neuralgia, some of you may have had occipital nerve blocks that seem to give some short-term relief, in which case that's one of the things involved. The upper neck facet joints we've known for decades uh, are common causes of headache in patients with chronic neck pain, including CCI patients. And then we've got things like the rectus capitis posterior minor, and that's a newer concept, but again, still one that would be more common than something like internal jugular vein compression causing headaches. So we all know that CCI involves excessive motion of the upper neck, C0, C1, C1, C2, C2, C3, all of those different areas. And these upper neck joints uh, can become beat up uh, by this extra motion. Uh, basically, they can get osteoarthritis or just get injured. And what you may or may not know, and in this case, you got C2 here, and C1 here and C0 there is that this arthritic joint here can refer pain directly to your head. So uh, you're not necessarily going to feel the problem in that joint. You're going to feel it in your head. So let's take these joints one by one and try to match these pain referral patterns. Again, that's where the, the joint refers its pain and see if they match up with your headache or not. So C0, C1, uh, that's gonna be the topmost joint here, that topmost joint between uh, C1 and the, or, and the skull. And it refers its pain kind of in this big area on the back of the head. Now. A lot of patients out there with CCI have pain in this distribution. Obviously, this is just the left joint I'm showing here. The right joint would refer to the right. So uh, this back of widespread head pain is pretty common in CCI patients, and that's where the C0-C1 joint 
refers its pain when it gets injured or arthritic. Then we've got C1, C2. So now we're talking about the atlantoaxial joint here. And this is going to be C1, and this is going to be C2. So we're talking about this level here. Now notice that it refers its pain kind of the, right at the base of the skull, and it kind of goes right along the base of the skull like this. And again, that's a pretty common pain referral area in patients with CCI. They'll come to me and they'll say, hey, I've got pain just right here. And oftentimes they'll use their hand like this to show me that it kind of goes across the base of the skull. And that's where that joint, if it's injured, refers its pain. And then we have C23, which tends to be a little bit more confined, but now we're talking about this joint down here. Uh, and again, it's re referring its pain to the back of the head, different than C1C2 uh, and not as expansive as C0C1. But again, this would be a common descriptor uh, or description of headaches that a lot of CCI patients would provide to me. So how can you tell if you're having headaches coming from these joints? Um, well, there's two basic methods there. One is treating the joint to see if the headaches go away uh, or improve longer term. The other is diagnostic numbing injections, also called a diagnostic block. And that's where we numb the specific joints to see if your headache goes away for a few hours. So that's how we get to either one of these can be used to get to a diagnosis. Now, be really careful here. Um, and I want to put a couple words of caution in. Uh, one is in order to inject this joint, uh, the standard is to use x-ray guidance and then put a radiographic contrast in that you can see on radio uh, on x-ray guidance, also called fluoroscopy. And that allows you to say, yes, I am putting this stuff exactly in the joint. Now, be very careful because we've seen a number of clinics claim that they inject these joints, but they do not inject these joints, uh, meaning that they're kind of putting the needle using fluoroscopy somewhere in the vicinity of the joint, but they don't meet the definition of actually making sure that they're in the joint. And it's unlikely that they're injecting into the joint. So patients are often very surprised. They'll go to one of these clinics in particular. The doctor will tell them that they put stuff in the right C0 or C1 joint. Um, I'll review the notes. That never happened. And then that procedure obviously has to be repeated. Uh, and sometimes that angers patients, right? Because they were told that they got stuff put in that joint. And in fact, it never really happened. Um, in addition, if we're injecting the C0 through C2 joints, which I've talked about quite a lot on this channel, uh, realize that you have to have a technology on that fluoroscopy machine called digital subtraction angiography to make sure that you can safely inject into the joint as the vertebral artery is close. And that just makes sure that you're not going to inject anything into that artery that supplies the blood to the back of the brain. And you really can't do this procedure safely without having that technology. The problem is that that technology is only usually on uh, the types of fluoroscopy machines that are used for interventional cardiology. And it's less common to be on pain management machines. And as I've said before many, many times, 99% of all experienced spinal interventionalists have very limited experience in injecting 0, 1, or 1, 2. So you've got to be careful there as well. And then two other words of caution. Uh, many spinal surgeons and neurologists uh, don't really understand this common medical concept that these upper neck joints are a frequent cause of headache. In particular, neurologists are really bad this way. They just haven't gotten the memo, and I don't know why, even though the stuff's been done for 30 years. They're kind of focused on, do medications work, or can I do a simple occipital block, and will that work? But they don't really understand uh, where these joints would refer their pain, or how to make that diagnosis, or how to send a patient out to see if that joint's causing issues. Now, routine spinal surgeons um, sometimes even have interventional spine people working for them in their offices. So they kind of get this, 
But many of the spinal surgeons who are involved in CCI, for whatever reason, don't necessarily understand about these upper neck joints. So be a little careful there. Uh, but routine spinal surgeons do seem to do it because they've got guys working in their office who can do these things. Um, Hence, be really careful because, you know, again, I've talked to lots of patients. Oh, I went to a neurologist and he told me he didn't know it was causing my headache pain. Well, regrettably, your neurologist didn't really understand the whole picture of what can cause headaches in a neck issue problem. So he never really completed that diagnostic workup. So in conclusion, we've known for decades that the upper neck joints, C0, C1, C1, C2, C2, C3, are a common cause of headache pain. And many patients get focused on much more esoteric headache generation concepts, but have never had these joints ruled out, which is kind of backwards, right? Since these are a common cause of headaches and neck pain patients, they need to be ruled out before you can hang your hat on anything esoteric causing headache. Um, so just make sure that again, you don't reverse the order of the workup. You know, I've seen a lot of patients who are now obsessed with the concept that it has to be intracranial hypertension that's causing their headaches, or it has to be a compressed internal jugular vein. Now that may be, but until we rule out these areas, which are much more common causes of headache, we can't ever get to those other diagnoses. So uh, just as in medicine, uh, for lots of different things and diagnoses, common things are common, uncommon things are uncommon. So you roll out the common things and then you start focusing on the uncommon. Uh, okay, so that's my uh, talk for today. I'm gonna switch over to some questions now. And okay, so let's start taking some questions here. Um, so Lori Porter Smith, what causes the transverse ligament to be thickened on MRI imaging? Um, so Lori, that's a great question because it gets into what ligaments and tendons do when they're not healthy. Both ligaments and tendons try to repair themselves but they're really unable to fully repair themselves. And uh, when that happens, then the body just throws more and more tissue at the problem. And what it's trying to do is to reduce the likelihood of that tendon or ligament failing. So it just makes it thicker. Um, strong ligaments or tendons are small and dense. Weak tendons are big and not dense. So that's why you see uh, ligament hypertrophy in something like the transverse ligament, because it's not yet strong uh, enough to do what it's supposed to do. Now, we can certainly try to strengthen that ligament, and hopefully it gets smaller, because again, smaller ligaments or small and dense is strong, and uh, hypertrophy is weak. Uh, Regenix, mid advanced by Harry Winston. Are the high uh, cervical facet joints ever fused? Um, not sure what you mean, Harry. If you mean surgically, um, yes, those would be not directly fused, but if you put hardware in, then you would fuse those joints. Now, there is a C1, C2 screw fixation where you can put a screw through the C1, C2 joint. That's a, one of the types of upper cervical fusions that are used use in CCI patients. Uh, is there a link between TBI and CCI? I, I wouldn't say necessarily a link, but certainly the same things that can cause TBI can cause CCI. And sometimes uh, symptoms in CCI are misunderstood as TBI. So uh, that's how they're linked together there. The, the same kinds of things can cause them. And they have a lot of overlap. Um, so we'll frequently see patients that may or may not have a TBI that probably have CCI. And it got me a misdiagnosis TBI because the doctor who made the diagnosis, something like a neurologist, really CCI just wasn't on their radar. Uh, Smith advanced by Linda Carmichael. Are the facet joints uh, the same as the vertebral phalanges? Not sure what you mean by vertebral phalanges. 
uh, asked me because some of my flanges were damaged. So you're going to have to put more detail there. I don't know what a flange is. If you mean an uncovertebral joint, that's a different thing. So give me some more info there. But a flange is not something that's a medical term for the, the cervical spine. Uh, Adil, have a uh, use solution for polycystic kidney disease, please. No, Adil, not something uh, I'm an expert in. So don't have any solutions there. Uh, Todd, uh, what are the right questions to ask if you know your medical team or to know if your medical team really knows how to diagnose and, and fix these facet joint issues? Um, well, when it comes to routine cervical facet joints, that can only be done by usually a fellowship trained interventional spine physician. So that would be someone who has a, a medical board specialty in something like physical medicine rehab or anesthesia or interventional radiology. Uh, and then when it comes to the high upper cervical joints, even those guys aren't really going to know how to do too much of those high upper cervical joints. So that's why we try to pick sites around the country that we can trust to do those joint injections or bring the patient out to, to Colorado. Uh, Allison, uh, hello, Dr. Centeno. I'm going to hop on Facebook Live to see if you have any insight. Bear implant for ACL tears, wanted to post a link. Uh, yeah, I know about Bear. Let's see, the person very, yeah. Um, so, uh, Allison, uh, Bear is an interesting new technology. Uh, the purpose of Bear in our mind would be uh, only for much, much larger ACL tears with retraction. So that's about one in three of the ACL tears that currently gets operated would be a bare candidate in our mind. Now, why is that the case? Simply because the other types of ACL tears that get operated, like the complete non-retracteds, can be treated more efficiently and much more quickly uh, using um, an X-ray guided injection procedure. Uh, uh, into the ACL ligament of bone marrow concentrate. So there's really no reason or rationale to uh, open someone up arthroscopically if you can do an injection that'll heal the ligament. And we have one uh, midway randomized control trial that's been published on that. We just finished up our, uh, our larger randomized control trial. So that'll be submitted for publication probably sometime this summer, maybe out in the fall, if all things go well. Uh, so uh, we've done the homework on our procedure, but bear would work well with the larger tears, uh, but it's not going to be needed for the, for the other types of tears, which are two and three that get operated on. Uh, those can be treated through injection very easily and very efficiently without the use of uh, surgery. Uh, as far as outcomes are concerned, I just saw someone post something on bear and the outcome was pretty poor. Uh, I have to tell you, it looked, it, it looked much, much worse than a bone marrow concentrate injection result for an ACL tear. So I hope overall that the bare outcomes are much better than I saw uh, recently online. Um, and that probably has to do with the fact that uh, bare is an allogeneic collagen, meaning it's, uh, or xenocollagen, meaning it's not from the species. It's a, it's a bovine collagen. And it also probably has to do with the fact that blood clot isn't the absolute best way to heal a ligament. Uh, bone marrow concentrate would be much more efficient than a blood clot. But most orthopedic surgeons don't know how to do a bone marrow aspiration. So that's probably why Bayer chose a blood clot. Uh, Stacy, hi, Dr. Steve. Corona, your photos, I fall into the C1C2 category, both sides. However, I get crushing pain. The center of basis calls sometimes only describes feeling the bottom of my brain is being crushed. Any thoughts about showing that cause this symptom? Yes, yeah, Stacy. so that would need to be a diagnostic workup if there's any question about any of that. So if you go online and uh, look at the headache workup blog, let me see if I could find that for you here. Uh, let's get to where I'm going. Here. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the right blog for you here. Okay. 
this is it. Okay, so let me share my screen here. So if you go to the blog and to uh, this particular one, uh, hold on a second, that's not the best share. So if you go to this particular blog, it talks about um, all the different things uh, which are right here that can cause headache uh, that are in the neck. So all of these things would have to be ruled out. Now that can be done in a diagnostic workup if the patient's more complex. So what a diagnostic workup means is uh, that someone will go ahead and block all of those or numb all of those up. Uh, to try to see if they're causing headaches. But this would be a good one to read to go through what all the possibilities are. Now, obviously, if those are ruled out, then it could be something outside of the neck, but uh, certainly the more common five or six need to be ruled out. Uh, do you recommend any clinic in Europe specialized in upper cervical facets treatment? Yes, the London site uh, Dr. Kierkor um, and uh, Dr. Uh, or first name is Zbig, those guys can go ahead and do the upper cervical facet injections to see if they're causing your headache. So that would be a good choice uh, in London. I've talked about them uh, here before. Uh, Robin, uh, do you all have your second nerves at C1C2? I'm having tense pain laying on my right side. I can't tell if it's a set or nerve. My last physical palpation showed pain in, uh, on right side, upper neck facets. Um, so there is a, a nerve just behind the C1, C2 facet joint there, the C2 dorsal root ganglion that could be causing pain or it could be coming from the joint. Best thing to do would be to go ahead and treat that C1, C2 facet joint or do a diagnostic block there to see if that goes away. Uh, HRH, how much C1, C2 ring is improve with posterior injections. You know, we haven't seen evidence that C1C2 overhang is, is improved with posterior injections uh, to date. So uh, not something we generally see. We, we do see it happen with the PICL procedure where we're in directly injecting the ligaments to hold the head on, but I haven't noticed it, which is posterior injections uh, at this juncture. Uh, CN, uh, can TBI or damage to the cerebellum of the brain cause issues with body, with body parts in the body, like weaker muscles, joints, et cetera? Um, a TBI normally wouldn't cause things like that. Um, and as far as damage to the cerebellum, that would cause more balance issues. So, um, so no, that, that generally wouldn't cause those types of, of things. Uh, okay, mine is complete terrible. Ortho says doesn't look if it's fully does not look as if it's fully retracted. Yeah, so if it's a complete non-retracted tear, then a much more efficient non-surgical way to treat it is with a bone marrow concentrate injection done under X-ray guidance and not ultrasound because ultrasound is just doesn't work as well. So I would go and look for a Regenix provider near you, or you can come out to Colorado, and that can be treated without surgery and uh, certainly doesn't need a bare procedure. Um, that would be overkill and just much, much more invasive uh, than, than really needs to be um, to, to heal that based on our clinical experience. Uh, Robin, I agree on I, I H and rebound intracranial pressure. It's a, it's a catch-all like fibromyalgia. The upper neck workup is a first line step. Yeah, Robin, that's what we see is we're, we're seeing a lot of patients who have been told they have this or maybe they went on social media and they, that's what others said they had, or it sounded like what they had, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yes, I would uh, tend to agree that uh, we need to rule out the upper neck joints um, before we get into all these esoteric things that might cause headache. Uh, let's see, CN. What part controls the nodding of the neck? And when I turn my neck to the left, it's more restricted than turning to the right. It's much easier when I turn my neck, easier when I turn my neck to the right. Uh, nodding of the neck is zero one. 
uh, and turning is one, two. So that's how those uh, come in there. Your video is frozen. There are parts of the answer. So if recording will be posted. Um, yeah, so Allison, uh, just so I can repeat it again, uh, much more efficient to get the ACL injected with bone marrow concentrate, your own, and have that help to heal the ACL than needing a surgery where they're going to put something foreign into your body like there. Now, listen, if, if you had a complete retracted tear, you know, with a big gap like a rubber band, there would be the way to go. But for a complete non-retracted tear, it, it, there's just no reason to get the surgery. It's not needed anymore in 2022. Now, I know, you know, the folks that made Bear are all rah-rah behind it, and the surgeons are loving it, this idea that they can maybe help heal an ACL. But the surgeons also need to learn how to inject bone marrow concentrate into the ACL, which they don't know how to do now. Um, and that would save a lot of surgeries and also save a lot of money, too. Uh, what is the patient what is in the patient's control that, which will improve PICL outcome well let's see uh, a lot of things right you know one of the things that you can do is since it's an autologous cell procedure you can try to make your cells as healthy as humanly possible uh, so that might be something like uh, eating well or losing weight you know we're seeing a good number of PICL patients come in with a lot of extra weight and that's not helping the outcome of the procedure. It's increasing inflammatory cytokines, which is making their recoveries harder. It's also causing lots of other problems, high triglycerides, um, poor blood sugar control, et cetera. So getting the extra weight off would be a big one uh, in helping to improve the outcome. Eating well. Um, and regrettably, another one would be uh, exercising, but I understand a lot of CCI patients aren't going to go there just because they can't. Um, so at least those two things would be very, very helpful. Era, uh, I have a question. I have a functional neurologic disorder that affects uh, the muscles. I have muscle malfunction of the neck. Will this make PRP or stem cells impossible? Um, you know, Era, I'm not quite sure what you're calling a functional neurologic disorder. So I need more information on that because that's not a medical diagnosis. Um, that would be more of a functional medicine diagnosis. And what I'm trying to avoid is big boxes in which doctors like to throw things and get to some instead some really specific diagnoses of what's wrong. So which nerve, which joint, which muscle, uh, what's that muscle doing? Why is it doing that? Is it doing that because something else is unstable and it's trying to compensate? Those are the kinds of things that uh, I'd really need to know. FND doesn't, doesn't tell me a lot as to, to how to give you a good uh, answer and to try to help you. Uh, Jake, inflammation in the upper cervical or scar tissue constrictor affect blood flow. Not sure what you mean by inflammation in the upper cervical uh, here in particular, Jay. So maybe if you could put some more information there. Uh, lots of things can restrict blood flow. One of the things that can restrict blood flow would be uh, uh, pressure from a bone can do that. Um, but uh, an inflammation certainly may cause uh, poor blood flow in general or, or more can cause swelling in certain vessels. So I'm not sure exactly what you mean there. Uh, Sian, can, uh, can facet joints cause instability to the ligaments. No, it's usually the other way around. The ligaments get damaged and then the facet joints get beat up. Uh, the facet joint capsules aren't major stabilizers. In fact, they're usually gone in the lower cervical spine, anyone over 40, meaning on the medial side, when we inject into the facet joint at 5'6", for instance, there's no capsule there in older patients and it just goes into the epidural space. So the facet capsules aren't major stabilizers by themselves, the bigger ligaments that are further out or internal to the head on the neck, like the ALAR transverse, would be bigger stabilizers. Uh, Robin, uh, my C56 is desiccated. I'm having numbness in my hands. Would EMG help diagnose before my next treatment? I also stand at a stand-up desk often, great for back posture, but my hands get taxed. 
Yeah, Robin, regrettably, an EMG nerve conduction study is very, is very specific, but poorly sensitive. So what I mean by that is that a, um, a good test should always be both sensitive and specific. Um, and uh, an EMG is specific. So if we find something on EMG, we can say there's a problem with that nerve. The problem is the sensitivity is very, very poor. So that means that about eight or nine times in 10, there can be problems in nerves that an EMG won't pick up at all. So that's the problem. So I, I don't think I'd waste your money or copay or deductible on an EMG, but you can usually make that diagnosis clinically on exam. Uh, scan, I'll send your scans to my assistant. I'll be seeing you online consult soon. Great, Yara. Um, HRH, how long after PICL should you use a dinner roll? I'm assuming it's one of three weeks of inflation. So uh, you shouldn't use a dental roll unless you're instructed to after a PICL. Um, and that's because a lot of our patients won't tolerate that. Now, there are some patients that do, and we would want them to get some curb restoration either before or after the procedure, uh, depending on how things are going to go for them. So I generally would not use a dental roll right after the procedure unless it's approved by your, your doctor. On the blood flow question, I feel like during my worst flare-ups, I had this sensation where it felt like something was off with my blood flow or breathing, mainly triggered if I knew the inflammation was particularly bad or if I bent my head down quickly or for too long a period. Yeah, that's probably due to, um, well, number one is it may not be blood flow at all. It may be something else entirely. So, for instance, it could be um, a bone banging into the vagus nerve, for example, uh, so you have to be a little careful on, on that description, but certainly increased inflammation can cause a flare up, which can then mess with all sorts of, of symptoms. And that's why, for example, in, in studies, we know that if you've got a herniated disc and, and not much whole body inflammation, the herniated disc symptoms don't last long, usually four to six weeks. If you have a lot of whole body inflammation, the, the same exact injury can last for six months to a year. Uh, and trying to get over it. So we've learned a lot this last 10 years about the status of your body and how that can impact injuries like this. So it, it's very, very critical to try to get that systemic inflammation under control. Now that can be supplements, that can be diet, that can be exercise, all of that stuff. Um, and obviously shedding the extra pounds is a big one. Uh, so that's something uh, to consider as well. Uh, let's see, are there other questions I can answer here, guys? Um, I'll give it a minute or two and also try to go backwards because sometimes these questions don't scroll through to me until later. Okay, so let me... I'll start wrapping this up. If other questions come in, I'm happy to answer those. Um, so as discussed, uh, it's really critical that patients who have CCI, think they have CCI, get these upper neck joints ruled out as a common cause of headache. I know many are told that they've got things like intracranial hypertension, that they've got things like internal jugular vein compression or Chiari malformation that's causing their headaches. The problem is the only way we can actually get to the diagnosis there is to do the surgery to see if your headache goes away. Obviously, for some of those surgeries, they're big, big deals, right? If I want to operate near uh, the, the artery that gives blood to your brain, the internal carotid artery, which is where we're going to be if we're doing an internal jugular vein procedure, uh, that's a super invasive thing. Uh, same thing if I'm going to take out a piece of the back of your skull to decompress a Chiari malformation. Um, so you don't want to wait until the surgery to try to figure out whether or not those are causing your headache. There are easier ways to get to are those neck joints causing your headache than removing pieces of your skull, which damp will permanently damage the upper cervical uh, muscles, um, or trying to decompress your internal jugular vein. So, you know, simple, less invasive things come first. Uh, bigger, more invasive procedures always come second in medicine. Uh, 
Stacy, can you do nerve blocks the day before the PICL? Usually it takes more than a day. Um, read that uh, blog, Stacy. It'll give you some sense of the timing of all of that. If we get lucky, it can be done the day before. But the problem is if we don't get lucky, meaning that if we don't find the source of your headache, it might take multiple days if we're doing blocks. So uh, one day is probably not enough, or at least it would, could cut it a little too close for comfort. Uh, Eric, can connective tissue restore after six months uh, if I still brace up a very good diet? Um, generally, if, if connective tissue, something like a ligament has healed in six months, it's probably not going to uh, in general. Now, some other caveats to that might be, let's say there's something about your posture or neck curvature that's putting extra pressure on that area and you fix those things, maybe it now has a chance to heal. Um, but outside of that, uh, no, usually um, uh, by six months, you get what you got. Um, oops, let me go here. So yeah, how does it take to see improvements in PICL? We're usually looking for improvements at that three to four month mark. Oh, thanks, Elvis. Uh, uh, Manuela, uh, do you know if amitriptyline is acceptable post PICL? Yes, it is. No, no problem with amitriptyline. Uh, era failed to brace due to no doctor helping and discs are bulging substantially on latest uh, supine. I'm assuming MRI. Uh, yeah, era, era, it's certainly good to try a test of bracing to see if bracing helps you. Um, and that would be using a neck collar, but I wouldn't use it too much, as I've said here many times, simply because it's a two edged sword, right? It can make the muscles weaker. But it's certainly good information for us to have if we're thinking about CCI. So, for instance, if you put on a brace, you're like, yeah, I feel much better with that brace on. Then that adds some weight to the CCI diagnosis side. Uh, how much improvement overhang is there, which is PICL versus PICL with BPC alignment? Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. HRH, I can tell you what the uh, improvement is per PICL procedure, but that's all I can tell you. Uh, Allison, I see Regenx for an SC tomorrow. Great. Uh, talk to them uh, about your ACL. And if it's a complete non-retracted tear, they should be able to treat it. Um, and if for some reason they, they say they're not sure, then send me a copy of the MRI. And I'm happy to take a quick look at it just to see if it, if it can be treated or not. Uh, Lori, not sure if my question went through. Uh, what would... Uh, yeah, Lori, initially I talked about this. So as I talked about before, uh, thickening of the transverse ligament um, or any ligament or, or tendon means that the tendon is weak. Uh, so for ligaments and tendons, uh, strong is a small and dense ligament or tendon. Uh, big means it's hypertrophied and it's weak. So what's happening there is the body is trying to fix it but it can't fix it. So it's just throwing more tissue at the problem and that tissue is not strong. But what it's trying to do is to prevent the ligament from failing. And in general, that kind of works. It may be a weak, but it's a little stronger than if it didn't throw tissue at the problem, even though it can't fully heal it. So bigger uh, or thickened ligaments are weak and uh, smaller uh, dense ligaments are strong. Is name an issue with the Regenix procedure? You know, Allison, it, it could be. Um, uh, we'd have to know what those numbers are and, and your size to get a sense of how much we would need to take. And all the Regenix sites have calculators to figure that out. So they can go ahead and easily figure out whether or not you, uh, uh, how much they can take versus your hematocrit versus sex versus size. Uh, surgery stem cells best to restore compressed nerve. I'm not sure what compressed nerve you're talking about, but in general for compressed nerves, uh, there's a couple of questions to ask. The first question would be what's compressing the nerve, right? Um, so if something is compressing the nerve that's moving too much or unstable, if you make that thing more stable, you've got no more compression. Uh, or it could be scar tissue around the nerve, in which case hydro dissection or injecting um, Platelet lysate around the nerve to break open the scar tissue would be the way to go before surgery. So, uh, so in general, 
uh, with regard to compressed nerves, surgery would be a, a court of last resort uh, if those injection-based procedures weren't effective. Um, wouldn't be a starting place as far as nerve decompression is concerned. Uh, okay, any other questions I can answer at all, guys? Uh, you know, we were talking here uh, before about upper neck facet joints and how that needs to be ruled out uh, before we get to esoteric causes like Chiari malformation or um, internal jugular vein compression or intracranial hypertension. Uh, because those sorts of things can be ruled out with diagnostic tests like facet joints in your neck. But when it comes to those diagnoses I just talked about, if you've got internal jugular vein compression, the only way I can see if it's causing your headache pain is to do a big surgery and see if your headache goes away. Obviously, that's a super invasive test of whether or not IJV is causing your headache. So common things are common, uncommon things are uncommon. And uh, the most common thing causing headaches in the neck uh, is uh, the upper neck joints. Uh, Barbara, why do ligaments get worse for untreated CCI? Um, I don't know if they necessarily get worse in everybody. I think some patients are kind of a steady state. I think what does get worse is the wear and tear that instability causes. So what I mean by that is that when you have ligaments that are loose, there, there's wear and tear on the joints, on the nerves, on, uh, on the tendons, on the muscles, et cetera. And all of that will get worse over time the longer the instability is there. Now we do have some patients that their instability probably gets worse too. And that's more wear and tear on the ligament than repair. But usually it's just the side effects of the instability. Uh, those tissues are getting beat up um, and they get more beat up over time. And that's why people get more, tend to get worse over time, I think. Uh, what scan should I get uh, for neck at uh, MedCerna Center in London, meant to be their 27, which is Friday? I think they do a great job on their CCI or rule out CCI protocol. So I, that's what I tell them to run. So generally that's flexion extension. They also do a nice lateral bending, um, looking at whether or not there's C1, C2 movement or whether or not there's change of position of the dens in the atlas. Um, and uh, they also usually do a C1, C2 rotation. Um, so I would, I would just have them run their, their usual rule out craniocervical instability protocol. I think they do a very nice job at that imaging center. Um, in fact, it's the only imaging center so far that I know about in Europe that I would send someone to with CCI because I think those images, while not as good as getting a DMX study, which is hard to do in Europe, uh, they're a close second. And so I, I think that's wonderful to have that place there. Um, and to have them available. Okay, so again, to wrap it up, as I talked about before, uh, the upper neck joints, common causes of headache, make sure you get those ruled out if you have CCI or you think you have CCI. Uh, I will be here again on Friday. And on Friday, um, I'll be, uh, specifically uh, again on all three of these channels. So Friday at, at 1 p.m. Uh, and so I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, thanks so much for watching today. Hope you have a great week and uh, I will see you guys on Friday. Thank you.